Hello, we are now going to speak about uh, hypothalamic asthmatic pathway gliomas. So the first part will be about the diagnosis and the oncological management. You know, uh, this is a common tumor in children. It has a behavior which is a very paradoxical because it is a low-grade tumor. However, it, uh, um, it represents a long-term um, disease and uh, sometimes malignant um, evolution, as you can see on the right. It has a so slow growth. However, it, come, it uh, can sometimes present with an acute presentation. And it is supposed to be a benign tumor. However, it may require chemo, irradiation, multiple surgeries, and can also produce metastasis. So it is certainly not a, a benign disease. And uh, the main problem for a neurosurgeon is that it is an infiltrating tumor. So we have to define the role of surgical resection in the management of this tumor. There was a, conference, a consensus conference in 2011 uh, in Paris, uh, among the conclusions of this uh, neuro-oncology meeting um, regrouping oncologists and neurosurgeons is that the overall aim of therapy in childhood and adolescent is to gain time by controlling the tumor and to preserve function, which is paramount considering the location of the tumor and uh, the young age of the children at the time of diagnosis and that multidisciplinary discussion should be the method adopted for all patients and for the diagnosis and so clinical decision-making. This is a fundamental tenet in the management of these tumors, which are complicated and very often uh, require repeated uh, decision-making. Uh, to back our uh, assertions, we uh, reviewed the series from Lille, um, we uh, collected cases treated over two decades um, and uh, we studied this series in 2016. So we uh, collected cases of low-grade gliomas in, in, involving the optic pathway, uh, not including uh, uh, tumors of uh, the optic nerve without involvement of the chiasma. Uh, tumors were operated or not, because as we shall see, many cases with NF1 do not need any surgery. So we uh, studied 33 cases uh, with a male female ratio about equal, a mean age of 58 months, median age of 38 months. So that uh, hints at uh, um, uh, a peak of uh, tumors in uh, the very young age because 34% uh, of these patients were under two years. What about the location? Uh, obviously, this tumor involves the chiasm in almost all of them. The hypothalamus in uh, more than half. Uh, the four, third ventricle in uh, almost half of these patients. And the optic nerve in nine, optic tract in eight, thalamus in two, and mesencephalon in two. Uh, so what was the pathology of these patients? It was a pilocytic, it was considered a pilocytic astrocytoma, which was confirmed, especially by molecular biology in 36 cases and considered probable in 39 cases, especially in non-operative cases. Uh, it was a diffuse astrocytoma in two cases and a probable pilomyxoid in some cases, like uh, this one on top on right, which, had, which occurred in a very young baby with a metastasis. And sometimes it is a probable hamartoma, especially in, in NF1, when, when you have a swelling of the optic chiasm without contrast uptake. Uh, the pilocytic astrocytoma is really one of the main uh, problems in, this, uh, in these tumors. It is the most common tumor type in children, as illustrated by this uh, drawing by Harvey Cushing in 1931. Uh, depicting a uh, cerebellar astrocytoma. However, we consider that all these different locations of the pyrocytic astrocytoma uh, are different disease, and uh, the role of surgery is very uh, different in cerebellar astrocytoma and uh, op optichiasm tumor, for example. So we, um, also, is, this looks like the same tumor, uh, the, if you multiply the different locations by the different age, we have uh, almost as many diseases as we have patients. Uh, we know that these tumors generally do not de degenerate in high-grade tumors unless they are irradiated. 
and we have the impression that the aggressiveness of these tumors uh, decreases with time, as is illustrated by the, the age pyramid uh, provided by the WHO. Uh, we see that the, the, almost all of these patients are under the age of 20, and in adults, we have the impression that these tumors cease to evolve, so it's really a pediatric uh, disease. And uh, among children, we are, we are aware that uh, the younger the child, the more aggressive the tumor. Um, these tumors are uh, variably aggressive, uh, accessive to surgery, to irradiation, according to age, and uh, also to chemo. So we have a choice. So we have to make the right choice, uh, being aware that uh, at a moment or another, we may have to make another choice, so we uh, better uh, spare the, the, the bullets because we may need of all of them. Uh, the molecular biology has been uh, really uh, decisive uh, during the last decade by, uh, 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 in uh, redefining the pilocytic astrocytoma. Um, so we uh, use less and less uh, the, the term pilocytic astrocytoma to describe um, a tumor on the histopathology alone. Uh, the histopathologist only speaks about circumscribed glioma, waiting for the molecular biologist to, uh, to step in. And um, we now know that the uh, BRFKIA 1549 film transcript is specific of pilocytic. However, 25% of tumors are um, fusion negative, and there are other, probably, uh, fusion transcripts which can uh, uh, cause uh, pyrocytic astrocytoma. We also know that there are some epigenetic modifiers, and uh, so it's getting more and more complicated, as you can see uh, from this uh, simplified uh, um, drawing on the right. And uh, what is the good news is that we have more and more clues for targeted treatments. Uh, optic pathway glioma and NF1 are very uh, much linked. Uh, we found some optic pathway glioma in up to 15 or 20 percent of NF1, maybe a bit overestimated, uh, but it is really a, a common uh, finding in our series. Uh, NF1 represented 42 percent of the cases of optic pathway glioma. Um, in NF1, these tumors uh, more often involve the anterior optic pathway, especially the optic nerve, which uh, where NF1 is, is prevalent and especially if the tumor is uh, bilateral in the optic nerve. Uh, in NF1, the tumor of the optic nerve is, uh, has, shows a special disposition, as seen on the um, pathologic slide on the right. We have a tumor sheath around the nerve, and uh, um, it has a very evocative uh, image in uh, MRI. Uh, we also know that in NF1, the tumor often occurs later in a toddlers or, or older children, and it shows less progression and no mortality. So uh, from our series, we compared uh, patients with NF1 with uh, sporadic uh, optic pathway glioma, and we found that the mean age was not significantly different. However, if we uh, count just children under five months, the difference is, under 24 months, the difference is very significant with uh, almost all the um, infantile cases in sporadic uh, tumors, uh, especially in cases under one year. And regarding the outcome, uh, the, the behavior of sporadic tumors is also more, much more aggressive. However, there is a bias because in NF1, we diagnose many uh, asymptomatic tumors. And if we could look at the uh, event-free survival, clearly there is much more uh, often a progression in uh, sporadic cases. If we now look at the clinical presentation of the whole series, uh, generally these tumors show a, a slow progression with vision loss. It may be uh, disclosed by uh, uh, visual screening at school. It can have an endocrine presentation. Um, and uh, very often the, the diagnosis is delayed because the children would not complain of uh, uh, vision loss. Um, there can be an, an acute onset in case of hydrocephalus, and very rarely uh, uh, um, 
an abrupt um, presentation in emergency because of tumoral bleeding. And finally, we have 15 of our cases who were asymptomatic. Uh, this is a case of a baby who presented in emergency because of uh, intratumoral bleeding requiring, requiring surgery in emergency for uh, tumor aspiration and uh, partial removal of the tumor of the um, uh, optic tract. Uh, Hydrocephalus can be caused by ventricular obstruction if the tumor uh, uh, occupies the third ventricle. Sometimes there can be an extra ventricular uh, obstruction uh, if there is a cisternal spread. And also, uh, CSF problem can occur after surgery in case of, uh, especially in case of uh, transventricular approach, uh, especially in infant. And the, these patients um, are very prone to develop a subdural collection. Uh, the ophthalmological presentation, as I said, is uh, very common in this patient. It can be a vision loss of one eye or both eyes, or it can be a visual field defect, especially a bilateral hemianopia. More rarely, an, a homolateral hemianopia if the patient if the tumor is uh, located uh, behind the chiasm. Uh, so this is a, a dodge uh, classification in A, B, and C tumors. Um, uh, however, the, the visual field can be uh, the visual field defect can be underestimated because the child can have a, a loss of uh, the central field in both eyes without noticing that um, uh, that he has a, this field defect, and uh, the adults do not um, just. Uh, don't remark that the child has a visual field defect. Uh, also, there can be a nystagmus in infants, it can be the first uh, revealing symptom, uh, or a strabismus, which can result of uh, amblyopy, or, um, and we really don't know if, he, if the strabism is caused by amblyopia, or if the amblyopia is a result of a, a strabism. Here is a baby, a five months old girl who had a some very prominent uh, troubles in eye movement um, with nystagmus, uh, which uh, shows that she has a, a vision loss, a severe vision loss. You also note that she has a Russell syndrome. Uh, she is very uh, severely emaciated. So the, um, in ophthalmology, we have other findings, especially uh, fundoscopy can show papilledema. Uh, which is uh, which shows severe intracranial hypertension, especially when there is hemorrhage or atrophy. You can ha you have also uh, to look for lysis nodule, which are uh, a sign of NF1, which are rarely visible by the bare eye. And you have to study the ocular movement, which can uh, be uh, impaired by tumor compression or intracranial hypertension, like in this case with uh, bilateral uh, abducens nerve deficit. The endocrine presentation, uh, these tumors can be revealed by delayed statural growth, uh, or you can have the opposite with acromegaly uh, because there can be uh, over secretion of a growth hormone or uh, iterate like uh, growth factor. So you can have a durable statural advance. You can have also a, a pericocious pu puberty, which can uh, be associated with a non durable growth spurt. And you can have a diencephalic wasting, like uh, in the Russell syndrome, uh, illustrated here on this uh, um, image, showing a slowing of uh, uh, weight uptake by this baby with uh, well, the, the same, basically the same weight at five months uh, than at birth. Russell syndrome uh, is uh, marked by weight loss, impressive emaciation, like in this, uh, in this baby with atrophy of the uh, subcutaneous fat. And uh, when you look uh, at the patient with the sun on his back, you can see the ear lobes are transparent. The growth is stunted in the end, but first it's, uh, the weight which uh, stagnates then uh, can be diminished. Uh, and this weight loss contrasts with a preserved activity. He looks like a happy child. Is, there is a, a behavioral uh, facet to this syndrome, and uh, it occurs very often, some, it, it seems, in younger patients with a more aggressive tumor. And, uh, uh, but it is not specific of uh, hypothalamic tumors. It, it, it is also found in uh, tumors of the first ventricle. 
So what do we do uh, to diagnose this tumor? Of course, we do an MRI. It shows where the tumor is, where the optic pathway is. And in fact, uh, it is one of the uh, hallmarks of this tumor is that we cannot see where the visual uh, with the optic pathway is because the optic pathway is the tumor. So the anatomic landmark is the arteries. The, the arterial communicating artery is elevated. Um, DTI can be useful, but it's not so easily made, and it can it can give a great uh, indications for surgery. However, uh, it, um, not all radiologists are able to uh, give you the information you need to operate. Uh, then, do we have information about histopathology? Generally, the uh, diagnosis is uh, clear when you have uh, such a homogeneous uh, contrast uptake. Uh, spectro MR can be also useful to have an idea of the aggressiveness of the tumor. And also, we have to look at the at tumor dissemination. So, tumor dissemination can be found at the time of diagnosis, which can be an indication in favor of, of a pyelomyxoid tumor, perhaps. Or it can occur at the time of tumor progression. However, dissemination does not mean degeneration unless the child has been irradiated. And um, in a historic series, uh, some patients with uh, valves used to present with uh, peritoneal uh, spreading, which uh, in fact does not occur anymore since we do uh, chemo in these patients. And uh, sometimes we have a late diagnosis of a spinal metastasis like here, uh, which we just have to observe and which generally do not progress. So uh, how do we make the decision for treatment? Obviously, it's a multidisciplinary decision, as has been said earlier, um, as uh, one of the main conclusions of the uh, consensus conference, multidisciplinary discussion should be the uh, reference matter. The consensus is needed for surgery because it is an aggressive surgery. We have to be all uh, in accord for the decision, for the aims of the surgery also for the oncological treatment. Also, if we decide not to treat, um, it's a decision of abstention, not an absence of decision, of course. And, uh, and especially for the management of recurrence. And this decision is informed by scientific data on uh, established protocols and from previous experiences with these patients. So uh, we have to decide between abstention and aggressive treatment, between chemo and surgery, mostly. So uh, when we have a large tumor, a symptomatic tumor with vision loss in a young child, non-NF1 case, pyelomyxoid tumor, a recurrent tumor, these are all elements in favor of an aggressive treatment, which can be surgical or chemotherapy, according to the uh, anatomic presentation. Then we have tumor of the basal ganglia, of the brain infiltration of the brainstem, metastasis. So these are elements in favor of chemo or abstention. Uh, then if you have hydrocephalus or cyst or hemorrhage, all these are elements in favor of surgery. And if the tumor is incidental in NF1, in an adult, a small tumor, a stable tumor, all these are elements to decide abstention. What about the chemo? Uh, classically, we do the LGG04 uh, uh, chemotherapy regimen, which is a, a platinum-based which lasts 80 weeks. So it's a, it's a very long treatment, but it gives good results. It is a reference treatment, which is still given in first intention in many cases. However, in NF1, we may have a choice with oral uh, vimblastine, which is uh, more easily given and very well tolerated, especially in teenagers. Um, but also have second line uh, chemos. We have immunotherapy. We have a lot of many of uh, different treatments uh, based on the uh, molecular biology. So we are very happy to have molecular biology to give us some silver bullets to administrate to our patients. If platinum is not enough, silver will do the job. Irradiation is uh, done uh, as late as possible, of course. Uh, we have to decide between focal irradiation in most cases, but sometimes in case of dissemination, we may need to give um, several focal irradiations. And in any case, we should avoid doing irradiation in infants, and especially in NF1, 
because uh, NF1 are more prone to develop radio-induced tumors or uh, vascular complication, like here with the uh, occlusion of the uh, arterial of the carotid bifurcation on the left. There is a risk of radio lesion, radio induced tumors, and, uh, uh, and it can be done only once or sometimes we have to discuss for repeated irradiation, but it, it is a very rare occurrence in uh, these tumors. So um, what, what is the life of these patients? We hope to stabilize the tumor or even to make it regress. Uh, sometimes the tumor remains stable but sometimes it progresses after we have uh, stopped the treatment. So we have to discuss of a repeated treatment, repeated surgery, successive lines of chemo. Uh, so the result is, as it, is that these patients are lifelong participants to our oncology meetings. And this is the number of uh, treatments in uh, the patients. You see that many patients have three, four, five or more uh, oncological procedures, including surgeries. And this is the oncological outcome in the little series. We see that the progression rate is 44% at five years, more than two thirds at, at 10 years. So really we cannot call this a benign tumors. And we see that 12% of these patients will die uh, of the disease at 10 years. We have a figure of 44% at 20 years, but this is biased because uh, very few patients are followed uh, that long. And the final oncological outcome, this is the, mean, uh, the, the results, uh, the oncological results after a mean follow-up of about eight years. Uh, the, the tumor residue is stable in almost three-fourths of the tumors. Um, so finally, the result is not that bad from an oncological perspective. Uh, regarding the clinical outcome, with the same follow-up, uh, five patients are dead of disease, one of intercurrent cause, and if we look at the uh, sequels, the majority of patients have uh, visual endocrine cognitive sequels. And if we look at the schooling, the normal schooling um, is uh, obtained in a minority of these patients. The long-term outcome, uh, the consensus conference said that the overall aim of therapy is to gain time in controlling the tumor and preserving function, which is not so easy considering the severity of this disease, regarding the endocrine problem, the developmental problem, vision loss, and late tumor recurrence. This is a baby who had a uh, Russell syndrome and she evolved into an, uh, an obesity. So she reversed her uh, weight curve. And uh, we reviewed uh, our uh, experience with uh, these patients uh, uh, among a series of uh, uh, patients followed for, for, uh, for brain tumors after the age of 20 years. So these are the results. This is a very busy slide, but if we focus on the optic pathway glioma, we see that uh, among these patients, um, the oncological is not so, so good because 21% had uh, a new tumor or a tumor progression. If we compare with PNET, and the, the results are not so better. And if we compare to the, uh, to the whole series, um, the oncological results are not so good in these uh, so-called low-grade tumors. If we look at the, um, on, uh, on the clinical outcome, we compare optic pathway glioma with PNET and the uh, total series, we note that the, uh, the, the number of patients who are normal at the end of follow-up are not better than in PNET and uh, less than the rest of the cells. Uh, to, to conclude, I, would, I wanted to show you this uh, observation of uh, a young adult in whom uh, these lesions were, were found on an MRI done for atypical headache. Uh, the radiologist was much focused on the Chiari, which was, which was present but not compressive. But we also noted that there was an, uh, a lesion in the hypothalamus, which looked very much like a tumor at the end of the treatment. However, she never had uh, any treatment and it was just discovered when she was an almost adult. So she had no treatment and she showed no progression of lesion. So maybe this was an optic pathway glioma, which did not evolve or she, it evolved like we, like, uh, like we wanted to do when we do a treatment. 
So in conclusion, this is a complex surgical and oncological problem. Uh, surgery is rarely curative. We have managed hydrocephalus. We treat uh, the, the management of recurrence can uh, involve surgery. It is mostly a multidisciplinary treat, uh, problem so, and a long-term management by uh, doing surgery and treating these patients case by case. And I finish with this, uh, uh, with this metaphor of uh, this painting by Watts. It is a, a blind patient uh, sitting on a big lamp and with a harp having only one uh, string representing the last line of chemotherapy. So I thank you for your attention. If you can have, need more information, you can find on uh, our website. And um, you can watch uh, other videos online on YouTube. Thank you for your attention.